Right, the next speaker, uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Marc Michel and, uh, from Paris, France. And Marc will be talking about the use of rituximab. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Adrian, for uh, the invitation. This is my first time here talking with, with you about uh, today the use of rituximab. So um, I'm sorry for uh, those of you who know uh, already a lot about ITP and uh, ITP treatment. Uh, I try not to make it too tri trivial, but uh, I think uh, it has to be uh, quite simple uh, and um, try to avoid entering into too many biological details. So first, wh what is rituximab? It is what we call a chimeric. Uh, that means it's an antibody uh, that is uh, built up in, in a lab. It's not coming from uh, animals or from humans. It's synthetic, but it integrates some pieces of um, antibody that are human and some pieces that are more look like mouse antibody. And it's a monoclonal antibody. That means that it's an antibody that recognizes specifically uh, a target uh, uh, or what we call an antigen, uh, as usually antibody, they recognize antigen uh, that are uh, um, uh, on the virus surface or bacteria or whatever. Uh, and here, rituximab uh, target uh, the CD20, um, which is a common nomenclature uh, for some of the protein that are expressed on, uh, uh, on white cells uh, in particular. Um, and CD20 is actually a marker uh, of B cells, B cell being a, a subset uh, of white cell. And among white cell, you've got neutrophils, you got lymphocytes, you've got eosinophil, basophil, etc. And some B cells are a subpart of what we call lymphocyte, which play a major role uh, in uh, adaptive uh, immunity. So it's not a chemotherapy. I think this is important to, to point out because at least in France, uh, a lot of patients, uh, they came out from their hospital and said, oh, I got my chemo. No, rituximab is not a chemo even if it's used and it has been developed uh, first for treating lymphoma that are malignancy, but it's usually given in combination with chemo when uh, uh, to treat cancer. Um, so throughout various mechanisms, I will not uh, uh, enter into details, rituximab induces a rapid and profound depletion uh, of the B cells. Uh, these cells are uh, usually uh, highly activated in the setting and ITP, and uh, there are what we call autoreactive B cells, B cell reacting towards uh, self antigen, uh, and uh, actually, uh, in the case of ITP, antigen that are on the platelet surface. So the depletion is very rapid and, and very uh, active both in the peripheral blood and as well as in the spleen, which is the major sites uh, where um, the autoimmune process develops in ITP. Uh, it's reversible, of course. We don't want uh, any patient to have zero B cells uh, for years or decades. That will be a problem. So uh, the B cell repopulation usually occurs uh, within six to ninth month after uh, rituximab administration. This drug does not target plasmocytes. Uh, plasmocytes come from B cells and are the cells that uh, eventually produce antibodies. Um, so here we target the B cell, but we don't target um, specifically uh, plasmocytes. So here, as you might know, uh, uh, blood cells are generated into the bone marrow and um, from a stem cell uh, upon different uh, factors, growing factors, some cell uh, enter into, let's say, the, the platelet lineage, the, 
the blood cell, the red cell lineage, or white cell, and here this is the differentiation uh, of B cell specifically. And you see this marker that is targeted by rituximab is expressed pretty early in the differentiation process in the marrow up to this stage, memory B cell and plasma blast, but not on plasma cell, those cells who uh, uh, produce the majority of antibody. So what is the rationale for using uh, irituximab in ITP? So um, as John Sample will probably uh, show later on, um, pathophysiology of ITP is rather complex and behind a, a, a simple, uh, let's say, biological abnormality, which is low platelet count, you can have many uh, mechanisms underlying the, the, the decrease of platelet. But activation of uh, autoreactive B cell, mostly in the spleen, um, uh, play an important role, uh, given rise to antiplatelet antibody producing plasmocytes and leading to um, the accelerated destruction of platelet, uh, mostly in the spleen, but also uh, impaired uh, platelet production in the marrow, since some of the antibodies may target some antigen uh, on the platelet, but also uh, uh, antigen that are there by um, megacaryocyte, which are the platelet progenitors. So the aim of the use of rituximab in autoimmune disease is kind of try to reset the immune system and restore tolerance uh, and just to count down this hyperactivation of B cells uh, uh, and make, it, make them uh, more tolerant towards uh, the patient uh, antigens. So this is the, the common principle for using rituximab in various autoimmune diseases that are mediated by um, pathogenic autoantibodies. So actually the first time um, uh, uh, rituximab was used for treating autoimmune disease, it was in a patient who had lymphoma, so they were, rituximab was formally uh, um, developed for treating lymphoma, which was malignancy of the lymph nodes, uh, because it also targets uh, a tumoral B cells. And the patient had uh, both lymphoma and rheumatoid arthritis, and the physician uh, observed that lymphoma was getting well, better, but also the rheumatoid arthritis, and that was the first uh, evidence uh, for developing this drug in, in um, autoimmune disease. And regarding ITP, the first report of the efficacy of rituximab in allele ITP uh, was published in, in early uh, 2000, and it's now uh, commonly used and licensed, uh, not in ITP actually, but in um, a variety of other uh, autoimmune disease, such as, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, which is a frequent uh, autoimmune disease affective, uh, affecting about 1% of the female population. So uh, this is uh, to remind uh, uh, Roberto Stasi, who were a colleague of us from Italy, who produced a, a, an incredible amount of work. And um, that was the first publication uh, in 2001 in blood. Uh, he report the treatment of uh, 25 patients, and uh, basically uh, the rate of response, uh, initial response was uh, 40%, which was quite good because some of those patients uh, have been uh, had been previously heavily treated. So in the last 20 years or so, there have been a, a lot of studies, uh, including eight prospective uh, trials. Uh, six of which was randomized, uh, and two of which was even double-blind with placebo and rituximab in one arm or another, the patient not knowing which treatment he gets, uh, neither the doctor. So what is the efficacy rate? The, the, res the result from the prospective study were, were a, a bit controversial. Um, uh, as two randomized studies did not show a significant difference between uh, rituximab arm and the control arm in terms of response. 
Um, I will not have time to explain why these two studies were negative, but uh, probably in part because the, the, the regimen of steroids and the tapering of, reg of steroids was left at the investigator discretion, as, uh, as we heard, is highly heterogeneous the way uh, corticosteroids uh, are handled, and probably uh, was that explain why in the control group the, the, the response rate was uh, unexpectedly high. Uh, in the other study, basically, uh, the overall response rate at one year was between 40 to 60 percent. Most of the patients who respond to rituximab uh, do so within eight to 12 weeks at the most after the first infusion, but earlier uh, responses can be seen in about a quarter of them. Of course, I will not uh, get into the detail of all that uh, study. You have here in that column the, the overall rate of response at one year or six months in the rituximab arm. Here you have the two study that uh, uh, were found out to be negative, but all the blue ones were uh, show positive result. So how rituximab is usually administrated? So the standard protocol uh, extrapolated from the lymphoma uh, uh, regimen is uh, four weekly infusion. Um, the dose is calculated uh, with the body surface. Uh, it's usually uh, administrated in day hospital and uh, duration. The first administration takes a bit uh, more. But if uh, everything goes well, uh, the three hours is uh, around four hours of IV uh, infusion. Uh, there is pre-medication. Uh, the protocol for pre-med may vary from one country to another, but we usually uh, give um, 100 milligram of IV meltiprilinsulin uh, prior to uh, rituximab to minimize the risk of, let's say, allergic uh, immediate infusion reaction. Um, there are alternative ways of administration, uh, such as uh, uh, the administration of two uh, fixed doses of one, uh, 1,000 milligram on days 1 and 15, and there have been studies in many diseases, uh, uh, including ITP, showing that basically uh, two doses uh, at one gram uh, give rise to the same efficacy rate as the standard protocol, and it's easier to the, for the patient. It, it comes only twice in the hospital and not four times. Uh, lower dose have been tested also by Drew, by Italian colleagues. They, they do work uh, um, pretty well, um, and also intermediate dose um, has been tested by uh, some colleagues from um, Holland. Basically, even they, we are lacking face-to-face -face, uh, comparator uh, study between uh, uh, those different regimen. Uh, there is no significant difference um, in terms of initial response, uh, but the time of B cell depletion is a bit lower when you use a smaller dose, so uh, that may influence the duration uh, of um, the response. And, but not uh, the uh, overall uh, initial uh, response. We now, for years, uh, use a biosimilar of Maptera or Rifduxan that was the primary uh, uh, commercial uh, drug uh, by Roche or Genentech. They are cheaper, they do, uh, they, the efficacy is the same, and in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, cost efficacy ratio, uh, that's much better to use by a similar. Uh, how about the rate of durable response? Uh, so based on a French prospective registry, um, we have followed almost 250 patients, um, adults patients that have been exposed to rituximab, and um, basically after five years of follow-up, we ended up with almost 30 percent of the patient that were still on remission. Uh, that does not mean that the platelet count was necessarily uh, normal, but was uh, at a safe level. 
uh, at least above uh, 40,000 and they did not require any other treatment after a single, uh, let's say, course or regimen of rituximab. So one third, it's not very much, but it's still significant. Uh, the problem we have is that, that we don't have any real marker to predict who is going to respond and for how long. Uh, in this the same study, the only parameter that was correlated with a higher probability of, of durable response was the magnitude of um, uh, response, initial response to steroids. The better the response initially to steroids was, the longer was uh, the response to rituximab. There is a trend uh, showing that maybe younger patient and female are more likely to, to respond to rituximab, but uh, this was not uh, significant in terms of statistics. How about the safety profile of rituximab? So you can sometimes have uh, immediate infusion reaction. That's why we, we give um, some pre-medication. It's like fever reaction, chill, skin rash, uh, dizziness. Uh, it occurs in about 1% of the patient. We usually stop the infusion, infuse like paracetamol or whatever, and try to restart uh, at a lower uh, um, uh, speed the infusion. And most of the time, it's not a, a, a big uh, deal. It does slightly increase the risk of uh, infection, mostly uh, localized in the upper or lower respiratory tract compared to placebo. And the incidence rate of what we call severe infection, infection uh, requiring antibiotics or uh, uh, in hospital care, is between two to five per hundred patients a year. Um, the risk of what we call opportunistic infections, so reactivation of infection that are seen, for example, in patients who got transplant or in a patient with AIDS, is very, very low. And, and the occurrence of um, uh, PML, who you might have heard uh, about, about that, is um, a, a very severe um, brain disorder, is really exceptional in, in the setting of ITP. Some patients have uh, immediate good tolerance and present within two to three weeks with like a flu-like syndrome. We call that serum sickness. It's uh, immune reaction towards the drug. It occurs in about one to two percent of the patient. It's usually managed with uh, corticosteroids, but it contraindicates uh, a further uh, infusion of rituximab. The risk of neutropenia uh, after a few months is very low in, in the context of ITP. Uh, immunoglobulin level, normal antibody may decrease a little bit, but profound decrease uh, affects uh, less than 5% of the patient. There is no increased risk of cancer, that is important. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, rituximab impairs the immunization after vaccination. So if you get a vaccine, whatever it is, within six months after uh, receiving rituximab, uh, you, you will not be able to, to produce antibodies. So it's, it's useless. So we try as much as possible to vaccinate patients against COVID, against pneumococcus, against uh, flu if it's winter time, at least two weeks before uh, initiating the treatment. <clears throat> Another question is whether or not it is relevant to repeat infusion of rituximab in a patient who um, has who had a, a, a initial response. So in clinical practice, at least in our center, if a patient has a good response that lasts more than 12 to 18 months, we usually re-challenge in case of relapse with rituximab. If the duration of the response is less than, than one year, we move to another treatment line. But in some other uh, immune disorder, patients uh, get treated every six months for one and a half of two years uh, we, without waiting for a relapse. And this strategy has been um, uh, explored by the prolonged uh, study that was uh, a primary investigator and coordinator was is Walid Ghanim in Norway. The study has included uh, uh, about a hundred of patients. It's been tough during the pandemic to include patients in such a protocol, but uh, 
uh, at the end, uh, we were able to make it. So uh, it's rituximab plus or, or, or minus dexamethasone, first randomization. After six months among responder randomization, you get the placebo or you get another rituximab. Uh, and we see when what happened uh, after one and two years. So hopefully we will have the result uh, by the end of, of the year. So uh, to to finish, when rituximab is or should be used in adult LTP, uh, in most of the country where it is available, and you can get a reimbursement since it's of of label use. Uh, it's now used as third line therapy after uh, TPO RA failure. Uh, however, it may be considered uh, as a second line prior to TPO RA in some uh, specific uh, subgroup of patients, some uh, who have uh, what we call secondary ATP, ITP associated with another autoimmune disorder such as lupus. Patients who had previous history of spontaneous thrombosis, we may be reluctant to start with TPO RA, even if it's a matter of debate. And the young women who have like not only antiplatelet antibody but antibody towards uh, other antigens, so a more general background of autoimmunity, are also a good candidate and usually responds um, well to to rituximab. Um, how we may improve the efficacy rate of rituximab? Probably by combining rituximab plus something else. Uh, to um, also target plasmocyte, I, I will not go into details, um, or combining rituximab with other uh, standard drugs that are used in ITP, or by using over monoclonal antibody that um, uh, decrease and deplete better than rituximab the B cell uh, compartment. So to conclude, more than 20 years after the first report of its use in ITP, rituximab still has a place in the management of adrenal ITP with an average um, uh, um, of 50% uh, of overall initial response rate and a durable response rate, uh, namely fi at five years or more, close to 30%. Its safety profile is really relatively, uh, I should say, is good. I mean, million and million of patients have been treated for many indications worldwide. Um, and uh, while we uh, miss now and the unmet, uh, let's say, goal is that we, we do not have any good and real predictor of response. So the best way to see if it works, it's only to administer it to the patient. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> okay, any questions for the professor? Hello, my daughter suffers from ITP and she has this drug. Every year, about nine to 10 months, it, it laps her platelets. Is there any way it can be prolonged? So you mean she relapses every year? Yeah, every year. And she's been retreated? Yeah, retreated. And she retreated. responds again? Yeah, yeah, every year it just goes. Yeah, so yeah, usually when you, res when you have a, re a response and you, re and you relapse, and you are rechallenged with rituximab in about 80 to 90 percent of the cases, you get another response. So it makes sense to retreat her with rituximab. So then it depends on the on the timing. If it's one year of response, I mean, it's it's quite good because she's off treatment for a year. Um, now the question is whether or not she should be treated. Um, before the, the relapse, that's why the, this protocol was set up. So we will have the, the, the data at the end of the year uh, to see whether or not the, uh, giving a, a second course at first, uh, after six months may prolong the, the, the duration of, of the remission. But um, you can't, I mean, patients in rheumatoid arthritis, some of them are, have been treated for 15 years every six months with rituximab, and it's not like uh, uh, there are many, many side effects. So it's feasible. Adrian. Thanks, Mark. That's a really comprehensive talk. In, in your, your previous slide, you suggested now that as clinicians we consider rituximab as thirst, 
third line post depot failure. Um, and that's sort of our attitude as a clinician. Some patients consider, well, I could try rituximab first because there's a good chance to respond. And if I respond, I'll be off treatment for a, an indeterminate period. Do you find patients dictate your choice of treatments? Or do you tend no, to suggest of course, no, of course, I, uh, yeah, I should have mentioned that it's very important to, to, to uh, I mean, integrate the patient to the discussion. It's not like uh, the dictatorship. Uh, uh, I discuss, I reassure you, with all my patients. Uh, and indeed, some of them um, prefer to start with rituximab. So, of course, uh, patient choice uh, is important in the, when it comes to decision making. But the fact, is, uh, as um, Drew has mentioned, that now we know that with TPORA is not only a supportive treatment, but in a third of the patient, we are able to taper and to stop treatment and the patient no relapse. Uh, so it's also uh, a way we can say, look, we can start with a TPORA let's say for three to six months, if we are not able to taper and stop, we move to rituximab. So that's a way also in the discussion. But yeah, at the end, the patient chooses. Can I just make a, a quick point, and then I'm going to pass over to Dr. McDonald, my learned colleague, who's going to fill in, fill in the blanks. Uh, we started with low dose, what you said about low dose rituximab. We started with low dose because our hospital wouldn't allow us to use full dose. So we try the low dose and it's a very cheap therapy. It's one vial a week for four weeks. It's very, very, very cheap. And we thought, we, our feeling is that it's just as effective in terms of response rate and durability. But Vicky has re looked at the data. Uh, Vicky, would you say something? You haven't got it wrong, Professor Perryman. Uh, yeah, so so from the ITP registry data, which actually we're not presenting today because we presented it last year, um, we had several hundred patients in both a 375 milligram per meter squared, so the higher dose once a week for four weeks compared to the lower dose. Um, and this is for, I suppose the caveat, this is for primary ITP. So this is not for patients with any other autoimmune disease, anything that might suggest there's a secondary cause or anything else going. This is just for primary ITP. Um, that the the um, peak platelet count, so the best platelet count that you get, the time to reaching that peak platelet count, so how quickly that responds, and then the duration of response, both for a partial response, so that is a sustained platelet count in this particular definition of over 30, um, or a complete response in this definition over 100 was the same. But I would caveat that that is for primary ITP. And I think, Mark, you did allude to this, for patients who present with, with um, quite challenging ITP who are secondary to lupus, antiphospholipid syndrome, I think you have to consider the wider patient and the bigger sphere. And I think that feeds into steroid dosing and lengths of treatment as well. And there's no diffusion reaction with low dose, even with the first dose. That's true. Um, That's true. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and BC depletion in ITP is good even if we low those, which is not the case with every systemic autoimmune uh, disease. Thank you.